And uh, Jane Ambexier is someone who literally needs no introduction uh, to a Toronto uh, uh, audience. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Uh, born and bred here in Toronto, now enjoying life in Paris, but leading Mercer's uh, global uh, responsible investment teams and uh, also a member of the uh, Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Um, so she's going to talk to us about that um, and lead off that by doing so, lead off our discussion on TCFD and disclosure. Thank you, Jane Ambexier, from your kitchen in Paris. <laughs> it is so elegant. <laughs> um, OK, fantastic. Um, great. So I'm going to say a few things about the task force. It sounds like a lot of you already know a lot about it, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but talk a little bit more about kind of what's happening now in terms of trying to promote the task force, uh, why we've extended it uh, through to at, at least kind of mid-2018, and uh, some of the other kinds of things that we're seeing in Europe and how those could also kind of, uh, kind of spill over into Canada and some of the things that all of you in the room are working on over there. Um, okay, so as, as you know, the task force was set up and actually announced um, in Paris around COP21 as a collaboration between Mark Carney and uh, Michael Bloomberg, who um, very graciously agreed to not only chair the task force, but support the secretariat, which really did a lot of the heavy lifting for the task force. So that was a, a couple of people, uh, specifically Curtis Ravenel and some of his team within Bloomberg, but also uh, Promontory, the um, advisory firm based out of Washington that Mary Shapiro is also associated with. So they had, you know, a, a number of kind of full-time people who were working on the task force uh, through the life of the project and who are still very much uh, involved in terms of promoting and supporting it. And that's really why the results, I think, are as professional as they are. Um, I mean, you can't really count on volunteer task force members who all have full-time jobs to do too much heavy lifting. So we were really there to kind of provide uh, guidance and, ooh, I mean, of course, to kind of make the key decisions about what the recommendations were, but it wouldn't have been able to kind of be achieved without a lot of the great background work and support from the Secretariat that was provided. Um, some of you may have looked at the differences between the draft recommendations, which were published last December for consultation, and the final recommendations, which were published in June. And you'll notice, of course, that a lot of the you know, the kind of the core structure and really the focus on governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets didn't change during that time. I think we, um, we got a lot of good feedback through the consultation process that the, the overall framework and the kind of the drive to push consolidation and consistency among climate-related disclosures um, was very welcome, was very needed, that, you know, we really didn't want to be the 401st initiative kind of focused on these areas globally, but really provide a way for companies and investors to, to look for more consistency. Uh, so that was, I think, a really positive uh, piece of input that we had through the consultation process. One of the, the key things that we did um, end up changing, which will be of particular interest to many of you in the room, uh, and, and some of you may have, have noticed this, and this was really based on feedback that we had from, from listed companies, particularly in the US, was more allowance in the second uh, and final report around, you know, kind of the reality that the first place these disclosures are going to wind up is probably not in the financials. It might take a little while for them to get there. And I think really, uh, you know, kind of looking inward from a lot of the members of the task force and saying, look, what is the objective here? Is it to say 100% these disclosures need to, to happen right away? And that they need to be in the in the financials, or is it to say that you know we recognize that it will take some companies you know more time to to gain the comfort that they need uh, around some of these disclosures and really to start thinking about what climate related risks and opportunities mean for them, and that you know the, the disclosures may end up in their uh, you know in the annual report, they may end up in a sustainability document, they may end up on the website, they might end up in their CDP report. Wherever they end up, having them available somewhere is better than not having them available at all. 
And so that was really very much kind of the spirit of, of that. And that was one of the, the kind of the key shifts, I think, um, in, those, in those differences. Uh, another kind of key thing I would point out about these recommendations is the, the scope of, of who they apply to. So when the, I think the mandate was really initially set up, it was very much from a financial stability perspective and looking across the market and encouraging appropriate disclosure so that investors, lenders, insurers have all of the information that they need to be able to make well-informed decisions and that that will drive and support you know, well-functioning capital markets. One of the things that we did in the phase one report very early on when actually the task force, I guess, was, was the initial group of members, I think we were 16 and then we went up to, to just over 30, was really to think about who should be disclosing. Should it just be a push for disclosure by those end companies or should we push for disclosure across the investment chain? And that's what we ended up encouraging and, and including in our recommendations. So they, they apply not only to kind of listed companies who were really the original focus, but also to the asset management community, whether they're public or private, and the asset owner community. So large pension funds, endowments, et cetera. Uh, really a strong encouragement for them to also adopt the recommendations and make available to their beneficiaries in terms of, of pension funds, their clients in terms of asset management companies, information about how they are managing climate related risks and opportunities and what their strategy is around that, whether they've thought about different climate scenarios, including a two degree scenario, and specifically that they begin to report the carbon footprint of their different strategies to their clients and their beneficiaries. So that is also a very significant set of recommendations to the investment management and the asset owner community, where a lot of the environmental disclosure frameworks in the past, as you know, have been focused more on the, on the corporate community. So a couple of the things that the task force is working on now is really on promoting adoption. And so the secretariat, as I mentioned, uh, is still very much in place and is working on setting up some different user groups of different kinds of, of companies from different sectors, as well as different uh, financial sector organizations who want to work together to really talk about how they can adopt the task force recommendations and what disclosure looks like. Um, another thing that is really a very kind of strategic uh, set of objectives is the relationship that the, um, the task force disclosures and recommendations have with the existing disclosure architecture that exists globally. So the Carbon Disclosure Project, or CDP, uh, which I'm actually also a board member of, has been um, very supportive of the task force since inception and has committed to align their disclosure framework and their questions for year end 2017 with the task force recommendations. And there's very good overlap already in a number of those areas, but there is some tweaking in terms of, you know, how, how exactly do they line up uh, and some new areas as well. And then for the investment community, the principles for responsible investment have their annual reporting and assessment framework, which all signatories after their initial grace year are required to uh, respond to if they would like to stay part of the PRI initiative. So the PRI is also aligning their reporting framework with the task force recommendations. And half of global institutional assets are signed up to the PRI with, with new signatories almost every day. Uh, and actually, we very notably just saw an announcement from Bloomberg's uh, U.S. defined contribution pension plan that they are the first U.S. D.C. plan to become a signatory to the PRI. And of course, there are so many U.S. corporations who are really kind of picking up uh, the task of, you know, trying to make sure that the U.S. Uh, kind of keeps its climate commitments through the We're Still In Coalition. I can imagine that you know, many, many more of those companies who are very committed to climate and, and have large pension plans, either on the defined contribution and or on the defined benefit side, will also start to think about aligning their behavior on the corporate side with the opportunities to do so on the investment side. And that's a big, you know, a big chunk of assets from a North American perspective who have not yet really been engaged in, in climate risk management or kind of you know, sustainability and, and ESG from the investment perspective um, 
as much as their public sector peers have been. So I think that that is something to watch on the horizon, both in Canada and also in the US, and I think could be a, a relatively big development. Um, a couple of the other kind of synergies around task force adoption and, and really trying to embed task force recommendations as a very kind of uh, stable and consistent kind of the new normal for disclosure is looking at working with stock exchanges and encouraging them to include um, task force related uh, disclosures as, as listing requirements. There is, of course, the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. Uh, a lot of the work that um, Steve Waygood uh, at Aviva, who is a fellow task force member, has very strongly been promoting and many others. So I think that that's another kind of interesting um, synergy. And I actually had, had lunch with, with a big uh, public sector investor in the US a couple of weeks ago. And we were talking about, and she was saying that she would love to have some kind of rules driven um, framework for triggering when sh they will or won't uh, vote in support of, of boards or audit committees relating to um, their performance on specific climate related metrics. And so that's kind of an idea, but you know, what are those metrics? What could they relate to? Task force adoption, you know, could be one of them. It could be around, you know, their emissions pathway. It could be about their climate leadership score from a CDP perspective. I mean, there's lots of different things now that you could think about in terms of how you could trigger those kinds of relationships. Um, but I think that that type of activity, if we see more investors adopting that, will certainly send a signal to companies. Uh, another related initiative that you may have read about, it was launched at the PRI in-person event in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, is the engagement led by CalPERS and the PRI around the 100 largest systemic emitters. Again, engaging with those companies, encouraging them to improve their performance from a climate perspective, reduce their emissions over time, and that will also include an element of promoting uh, kind of TCFD-related disclosures by those companies. So I think there's a, a lot of different initiatives around the world. And actually another one is that the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative has coordinated a group of, of 15 or so banks who would like to work together to figure out what TCFD adoption means for, for banks and for their loan portfolios and how they can kind of think about um, kind of trying to put, put some figures around those risks and thinking about them in the context of the broader risk and opportunity set and what kind of disclosures could, could evolve from that. And really how does, how does the recommendation around looking at the potential impact of different climate scenarios, including a two degree or lower scenario aligned with the Paris Agreement, how could existing bank architecture that exists for stress testing uh, be applied to climate? And what are some of the challenges around looking at climate scenarios instead of some of the other macroeconomic scenarios the banks are, are already um, testing on a regular basis? So of course, one of the key time uh, challenges around that is time horizon. And the fact that stress testing, you know, in, in the U.S., sorry, in, in Canada, um, you know, is really looking over a much shorter period to, you know, one, two, three, four, up to kind of five years, where a lot of the, you know, climate impacts uh, tend to go, you know, much longer. They don't only go over the longer, longer term, though, of course, we're seeing, um, we're seeing kind of impacts uh, over the, the coming decade, over the coming few years at an industry level, at a sector level. And in fact, when we run our climate scenario analysis uh, from a Mercer perspective, we find that the average annual impact of a two degree scenario is actually bigger over the coming 10 years than it is over you know, the coming 30 years because the, the pace of the transition will be, you know, if, if we're to achieve it, it, it will, you know, in that pace to get where we need to go in terms of reducing emissions, it will happen uh, more quickly than, than many people expect. So that will lead to, to damages and, and, and opportunities in a, you know, not only in a multi-decade perspective. Um, so those are some of the, the kinds of ways that the task force is working with different groups to really, from a very practical perspective, try to embed the recommendations and this type of practice into kind of day-to-day -day activity. Um, there, the next kind of formal communication from the, from the task force will be a report that will come out in September 2018, which will really look to uh, provide a summary of adoption uh, globally. 
So to capture a lot of the work that's been done and report back on how adoption and take up and, and performance to the extent that it can be kind of uh, calibrated and reported on uh, has been so far around the rollout that we've seen globally. Um, so that's going to be kind of the, the, key, um, the key next delivery from the task force. Um, but of course, there are also lots of other initiatives and ways that the task force is being kind of, um, you know, promoted or connected to other initiatives. And one of them that many of you will have heard of, I expect, um, is the high level expert group that was set up by the European Commission, which is looking not just at climate, but a broader mandate around sustainability, ESG, kind of long term value creation. And what are the different pieces of, of policy and legislation and, and opportunity really to align those and to create more consistency and clarity and achieve more impact in terms of moving European capital markets forward on, you know, on all of those fronts. And I know there have been some discussions around, you know, the opportunities that exist in Canada to, um, you know, potentially set up a, a group of that nature or other groups to really try to um, kind of continue to move things forward. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I left Canada uh, to move to Paris two and a half years ago, which was, was great timing uh, to come over here in the lead up to the, you know, the Paris climate agreements. And and all of the, the, the amazing things that have been happening here. But at the same time, from everything that I hear, uh, it's also been a great couple of years in Canada. And I know that there's been a lot of progress in terms of many of you in the room being involved with different initiatives, whether it's around you know, coordinating more effectively among investors or encouraging you know, public policy developments moving in the right direction. So I'm very, uh, very encouraged to hear that. So I guess I'll just close on a, a quick kind of um, anecdote, and then I'd love to take any any questions or get into a discussion um, within, with those of you in the room to the extent that we have time to do that. Um, one of the, the closing chapter in the, the Mercer study that we wrote in 2015 called Investing in a Time of Climate Change uh, put forward the concept of investors as future takers or future makers. And we said that, look, we're, we're all future takers, right? We're all going to be influenced by whatever happens. A two degree scenario, a four degree scenario, it will impact all of us and we can either be climate aware or climate unaware, right? So at a minimum, we wanna make sure at Mercer that our clients are climate aware future takers so that they can kind of try to track what scenario is unfolding and position themselves in the, in the optimal way accordingly. And I think, of course, from a, a corporate perspective as well, that that is what uh, you know, directors need to do and need to be thinking about. But I think the really interesting thing that we've seen over the last couple of years, and, and actually even longer because it directly influenced the outcome of, of Paris, was that more and more investors and companies have also become future makers, where they're very open and clear around their corporate or their you know, investment objective of not only being prepared for whatever climate scenario unfolds, but actively trying to influence which scenario unfolds. And to say that, look, a two degree scenario is gonna be better for capital markets. It's gonna be better for my performance. It's also gonna be better in terms of creating the kind of world and society that my clients and my beneficiaries and my pensioners want to retire into. And I think it's that kind of commitment and connection between um, you know, the capital market implications and the social implications, which you know, over the long term are the same thing. Uh, it's really that engagement by the corporate and the investment community that uh, helped to achieve the Paris Agreement, right? And that in the United States, that we're still in coalition that Michael Bloomberg and Jerry Brown are coordinating around companies and investors and cities and states, you know, working together to pick up the U.S. national commitments um, is a very kind of very interesting and important um, kind of political uh, economic uh, dimension that we're very much living in today. And I think um, encouraging more Canadian institutions to think about their role as future makers and really equipping them with the information that they need to be able to do that from a, a financial and economic and a, and a moral perspective uh, is, is certainly a big part of, of why I'm involved with the task force. And so I'll leave it there and very much look forward to any questions or, or feedback.
Jane, that was a fantastic overview and so optimistic. Right? It's really <laughs> we it, have to be right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's a character uh, trait. Um, are there is there a question or two? Yeah. Okay. And why don't you identify yourself uh, for Jane's benefit? Thank you. Hi, Jane. It's Dave McLeod, City of Toronto. We met when you were in Toronto before. Um, I've worked for the corporation of the City of Toronto for uh, 15 years. The last 12 are focusing on understanding the physical risks of climate change across all infrastructure systems. And speaking of disclosure of climate risks, I mean, we have reported out on this. And uh, it's interesting that the TCFD was uh, partly financed by, by Bloomberg. Uh, they also finance C40, uh, which is a group of mega cities around the world working together. Uh, I'm involved with the climate risk network of C40. And uh, what we're all about is, is understanding the climate risks. Now, uh, it occurs to me that, uh, I mean, cities are sort of a business. And I mean, attracting, for instance, Amazon to Toronto has been in the news today. And uh, it, it occurs to me that um, extending these ideas of corporate disclosure actually to cities uh, could be quite relevant. We have not spoken of this so far uh, in our meeting today. And I just thought maybe you might be able to comment. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, that's a great. That's a great point. And I mean, as as you know, CDP has also um, a kind of cities uh, element in terms of their disclosure. And I think, given CDP's alignment with the task force framework, I think there's an opportunity to kind of carry some of that some of that over into the the city's work. And they're also involved with the work uh, with Bloomberg. So I agree. I mean, I think part of what this whole initiative is about is looking for common metrics around climate and normalizing those and bringing them into the everyday economics of how investment decisions get made, whether it's in a city or by a bank or an insurance company or a long-term pension fund. And so from that perspective, I think it is very, uh, very transferable. And, and in fact, you know, of course, yeah, I think it's 70% of emissions come from cities, some statistic like that. So providing cities with the capital that they need to be able to put in place those emission reduction strategies is of course, an investment priority, particularly for investors who have kind of self-proclaimed as, as future makers. And I know that CDP just sent out an invitation for an initiative called um, Matchmaker. I'm not sure if you, you saw that. And they're setting up an online platform for cities to actually um, kind of put in their investment requirements and in different projects that they have and match make with potential investors who then would be able to provide that capital. So I think we're starting more of a starting to see more of a kind of ecosystem emerge around that. Oh, that's that's very exciting uh, because as yeah, as you know, uh, some of the pro some of the larger investors say that the projects to invest in are a little too small for them. Uh, so if they can see uh, a whole network of them, we still might need uh, aggregation vehicles, but of projects. So. Yeah, I mean, that's the big problem. I think we do need more aggregation vehicles and, and those groups in the middle who can help to do that. And, and then you get into issues around fees on fees and the due diligence and, and kind of unknown project track records. And those are some of the very practical barriers that we're facing. And I think we need, um, and those are the kinds of things where if you have organizations that are very committed to overcoming those challenges, then they're, you know, they'll prioritize the way to find the solutions. The solutions are achievable. But when you have, you know, too many different priorities and, and, you know, chasing small deals that are uneconomic in and of itself doesn't make sense. But if you really have prioritized climate and allocating capital to cities to help address that, then it might make sense. So it's, you know, kind of thinking about the strategy and the philosophy also from a board and a director perspective, I think is really the first step to be able to, to achieve some of or overcome some of these other hurdles. All right, well, I think we should, uh, oh, one last question, yeah? Okay. Thanks, Lynn Johansson. Um, we've talked a lot about, or some bit about cities, we've talked about big corporations, but small and medium-sized enterprise constitutes a healthy contribution to the GDP of every country, as well as a significant portion of the business profile at at least 98%. In the discussions that are going on, has anybody thought about how we're going to relate these big company and big investment tools down to a practical level while small business can get involved? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, we did talk about that a lot from a task force perspective. And you'll see that we we do, and we were, you know, we had a little bit of back and forth because we were getting slapped on the wrist a little bit sometimes for kind of overstepping our mandate. But we do explicitly encourage private companies as well to also adopt the recommendations. And I think that the way that they're set up with the kind of high level structure that every company could, could make a disclosure around the extent to which they have governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics around climate, a qualitative discussion of that. And that's really a starting point. And then I think you, know, you can get more sophisticated as you, you know, over time, you get more experience with setting targets or things like that, but that doesn't need to be where, where you start. So our thinking was very much that, that the framework for climate-related disclosures is really applicable to everyone. So thank you very much. Let's thank Jane again. Now, thank you. I, I know uh, you have uh, other obligations uh, now, but uh, should those other obligations have fallen through, or <laughs> you, her children? <laughs> you know they... what? It's school holiday here, and we're on our way to Zimbabwe tonight. Okay. So well, thank I'm you go so much. <laughs> thank you uh, for your patience with our technolo technological difficulties. Too. No problem. No. Thank you for the invitation. Have yeah. a good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.